Okay, so we're here again at Kashao Station. I don't know how we always seem to end up here, but uh, today, uh, different. We're not going to McDonald's. We're not going to El Palacio de las Aguas Corrientes. And we're not going to wander around on a Sunday trying to find, uh, you know, something to film on Election Day, only to end up going to a mall and buying a pair of earbuds. No, today, today we are going to uh, walk down the street about five blocks, and there's something there that we want to see. Uh, I'm going to start walking, and we'll talk about why, why we're walking down this street. As always, it is loud, but that's okay. It's gonna be loud. It's a city, the block is buzzing, lots of people going about their day. Where are we going? Well, we are going to go to the oldest Jewish temple or synagogue in, uh, in Argentina. And we want to talk about the history of Jewish people and Jewish immigration in Argentina because uh, until I started doing a little research into this I did not know that uh, there's this pretty sizable population of uh, Jewish people in Argentina. In fact, uh, Argentina has the uh, largest Jewish population in all of Latin America and if you break down the numbers roughly half of Jewish Spanish-speaking people live in Argentina. So uh, it's a pretty sizable population and there is a uh, decently long history of Jewish immigration to Argentina and Buenos Aires here is a uh, oh, about to get run over by a bus. Buenos Aires is a uh, is a center of um, like a Jewish diaspora in uh, in uh, Latin America. So the place that we're going is called Templo Libertad. And like I said, it is the oldest Jewish congregation in, uh, well, in Buenos Aires for sure. I think actually in all of Argentina. Um, and as we get closer, we'll take a look at it. Hopefully they're gonna let us film inside. I don't know if they are or not. But if they do, uh, we can take a look inside and we can talk a little bit more about the uh, long and storied history of Jewish people in Argentina. So let's go. All right, so we're pretty close uh, to the temple, but before we head over there, uh, right next to it, there is this uh, beautiful, beautiful plaza we found here. I believe it is uh, Plaza Lavage. Anyway, take a look. Very nice, very nice plaza. As always in Argentina, especially in Buenos Aires, you walk a few blocks, you're gonna find a beautiful plaza. So, I wanted to sit down, talk a little bit more, um, specifically about the temple, uh, but also about uh, some of the interesting history of uh, Jewish immigration to Argentina. So you can trace the history back, all the way back to the colonial period, the Spanish colonial period, all the way back to like the 1500s. And uh, at that time, it's the time of the Spanish Inquisition, and uh, essentially, uh, Jews had to be in hiding. They, 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 were, they had to practice in secret. And during that period, the colonial period from the 1500s up to the 1800s, the early 1800s, uh, many uh, Sephardic Jews from, from Spain uh, fled to different colonies, different Spanish colonies, still practicing in secret. And one of those is Argentina. And when Argentina gained independence, uh, in the early 1800s, 1816, I think, um, they they banned the Inquisition, and at that point, uh, Jews were allowed to practice openly, and this resulted in a large wave of uh, of Jewish immigration. Largely, at this point, from Western Europe, uh, places like Italy, and uh, later in the 18 or 19th century, in the 1800s. Um, when Argentina opened its doors uh, and had an open immigration policy, there was a lot of immigration from all over Europe. Um, at this time, especially in the late 1800s and the early 1900s, you had Jews um, coming from, the, uh, from Eastern Europe and Russia 
try fleeing the pogroms that were happening there. And uh, by essentially the early 1900s, there were about 150,000 to 200 um, uh, Jewish immigrants here in Argentina. By the outbreak of uh, World War II in the late 1930s, uh, countries all across the world uh, began to tighten immigration and uh, they began to, um, to uh, prohibit Jews from immigrating to countries and Argentina unfortunately was one of them. Uh, so what's, what's really interesting about the history there is um, after World War II when Juan Perón took power, ever the populist Juan Perón, he would make public statements both uh, sympathetic to Jewish communities and to um, uh, Jews who had been affected by the Holocaust, lost family members in the Holocaust, saying essentially that they, uh, they were welcome here in Argentina. At the same time, he was also uh, harboring um, Nazi war criminals here in Argentina. And there is a very interesting story, of course, uh, that has been widely publicized, and that is the story of uh, the capture of Adolf Eichmann by Mossad, the uh, Israeli uh, intelligence service. See, Eichmann was probably one of the worst of the worst of Nazi war criminals. Uh, he was a high-ranking member in the Nazi party. He was in charge of overseeing all the death camps uh, during the Holocaust. He's the worst of the worst. And uh, after World War II, he fled, and he fled here to Buenos Aires. He actually lived in a small, um, uh, like a small town outside of Buenos Aires. I'm not going to mention the name of the town. It's easy to find. Um, the reason I don't mention it is because uh, you actually could, if you wanted to, go and see the, uh, the site of his former house. Now, it's been torn down. And the reason it's been torn down is because the people of this town do not want it to become like a tourist attraction, and for good reason. Uh, but if you are interested, there is a, a movie from the 70s, I believe 1970. Uh, it's called uh, The House on Garibaldi Street, I think. And uh, it tells the story of how um, uh, the Israeli intelligence service Mossad uh, tracked down and captured uh, Adolf Eichmann. The reason they captured him, interestingly enough, was because uh, the, uh, the government of Argentina was uh, not known uh, for, or, or they were known for uh, rejecting a lot of extradition requests for Nazi war criminals. And so the Mossad intelligence agency, rather than putting in an ex extradition request once they figured out where he lived and that he lived outside of Buenos Aires, they just sent a team in and, uh, and captured him. And they brought him back to, uh, uh, to Israel where he was tried and found guilty and hanged. So, good riddance. Uh, but that's, that's the story. And like I said, you know, you could go out there and visit it. I, was, I really didn't want to do that because, like I said, the, the people of the town, they don't want it to become a uh, tourist attraction for good reason. And I want to respect their wishes. Um, but it's just something that highlights the uh, duality of uh, Argentina here, both being welcoming to uh, a lot of immigrants, a lot of Jewish immigrants, uh, and also the, the just um, incredible uh, populism and populist image of Juan Perón, who, uh, who was <laughs> sympathetic both to Jewish Holocaust survivors and to Nazi war criminals. So, uh, when I said before in a previous video uh, that Juan Perón is a controversial figure here in Argentina and also around the world, uh, that's one of the reasons why. But um, enough of this, uh, we're going to go over to see the temple, which is actually right behind me. So let's get up and flip the camera around and head on over there. So we're on the other side of this plaza. We can take a look as we walk over there. There is a, uh, what is this? Oh, there's like a moving truck in front of it, blocking our view, which is a real shame. But uh, I think when we get closer, we'll be able to get a good, a good view of it. It's right here on the block. It's on the corner. And um, it's, uh, it's not incredibly, incredibly huge, um, but it is, I've seen pictures of it, and it is some pretty, uh, pretty cool looking architecture. And um, I believe 
this the, the construction was started in like the late 1800s and then the cornerstone or I mean the uh, the construction was finished in the early 1900s so like with a lot of things in Argentina there was a big um, uh, boom of construction in the late 1800s uh, so here it is we're walking up to it right now and you can see it and like I said I don't know if we're gonna be able to go in here and film uh, but we can get a good shot right here beautiful building beautiful architecture and it's right here it's right on the on this block you know there's other buildings right up next to it uh, so I'm gonna turn the camera off now uh, but I do want to go over and just I don't know poke my head in see if I can uh, find someone in there who maybe I can ask to see if we can film in there I'll explain to them in my terrible Spanish that um, I am trying to film a video about Jewish immigration and Jewish history in Argentina and we'll, we'll take it from there so uh, <laughs> You're either gonna get a video from inside or you're not. So we'll find out soon. Okay, so it turns out we can, I don't know if we can go inside the temple itself, but there's a museum right next door and um, uh, we can go in there, but we can't film in there. We can, I'll show you the sign. It says, uh, let's see there, see, Museo, Museo, Studio de Buenos Aires. And uh, given what's going on in the world right now, um, in uh, December, early December of 2023, uh, there's a lot of security here. There's a police officer standing right in front. Uh, the person who, um, uh, who I spoke to at the door and asked if I could film inside and how much it cost to enter. Uh, he asked me where I was from. I told him I was from the United States. He asked to see my passport. I showed him my passport. So they're taking security very seriously here. Uh, which you know, grant, which makes sense uh, given what's going on, and um, uh, but uh, like I said, I can take pictures inside, but I cannot film inside. So we're gonna shut off the camera here, and when I get inside, I will take some pictures of the museum, and we'll we'll clip that all together in the video. And I don't know if I'm actually gonna be able to get into the temple itself, um, but if I am, I'll take pictures inside there too, so you can see what it looks like. The first room had uh, a, a number of books. Uh, older books, uh, Jewish or uh, Hebrew Bibles, uh, also the Talmud, which is like a text of uh, Jewish religious law. It sort of uh, serves the purpose of like a guide to daily Jewish life, and they had an old one here in this case. They also had uh, Torah, which is the Jewish scripture, the first five books of the Hebrew Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and uh, De Deuteronomy. No, Deuteronomy. Um, and that was in this, this case here, spread out, and then above it, there was this art, uh, like artwork, uh, painting of um, uh, a, a rabbi studying the Torah. I don't know exactly uh, who did this painting or what painting it is, but I mean, if someone knows, you can leave it down in the comments, I guess. Also in this room, there was this, this painting that I thought was really interesting. Um, this one is actually called Rabinos, and it's by Pedro Roth. And Rabinos means rabbis. So Pedro Roth actually is an artist, uh, a photographer, a filmmaker, and he uh, lives in Argentina, but he was born in Hungary in 1938, and his father uh, died in Auschwitz. He moved to Argentina, and he actually has a number of other paintings that are all in this similar style, which I think is a really interesting style. Uh, in the next room what, that we went into in the museum, this was an exhibit that was like a temporary exhibit. And I think in this room, they have uh, temporary exhibits, like rotating exhibits. And this one was an artist, uh, Boris Lurie. The exhibit was called Testimony of Horror. And it was, Lurie um, did a war series, a series of sketches and artwork depicting atrocities of World War II and the Holocaust. Um, he had several of his family members died in the Holocaust. And so they had some of his sketches here 
um, along with um, like clothing that was worn by a Holocaust uh, prisoner during uh, in, in one of the concentration camps. And that, those were around the outside of the room. And in the center of the room, there was a dining table. And on, the, on each of the chairs, there were pictures of Israelis who have been taken hostage by Hamas in the current ongoing uh, war in Gaza between the uh, IDF and Hamas. And that was a really um, powerful juxtaposition, I think, in this, uh, in this exhibit. And I know that the, you know, the, the table and the pictures of the people who have been taken hostage, those are not, obviously, Boris Lurie's art. Boris Lurie passed away. Um, he's no longer alive. But it was an interesting and very uh, powerful juxtaposition to see the Boris Lurie works around the outside of the room and then to have this uh, work with the dining table and the pictures in the center of the room. Um, from there, we moved on to a room that had more of the history of, um, of the migration of Jews from Europe to Argentina, which I would like to say, uh, looking at these, these uh, placards that sort of uh, explain the history, I got it pretty much right in the uh, first part of the video, so I'm pretty happy about that. Um, I have the placards here and in Spanish, but then also uh, I used Google Lens on my phone to translate them into English. And the Google Lens translation is not always 100% accurate, but it's close enough. So um, I'll put up the Spanish one first for a little while and then the English one, and you can pause and take a look and read through if you'd like. The first one was depicting, like I said, the overall history of the migration from, Argent uh, from Europe to Argentina. Um, the second one was the history specifically of the JCA, which is the Jewish Colonization Association. And that started with a group of families from Europe, uh, I believe eight, eight families, nine families, something like that. They came from Europe and they settled in Argentina and when they did, they, um, they bought up land uh, and, and farmed that land, but they also bought more land in, with the purpose of reselling it to future settlers who came from Europe. And over the years, they sort of started a, a makeshift commune with all of these families of settlers who came and purchased land. Um, and this went on all the way up through the 1930s at which point Argentina began to restrict um, Jewish immigration, like I mentioned, all the way up to 1938. Uh, in the next, the next room, I saw this really interesting um, story about Jewish gauchos, which struck me because gaucho is like the, the name for cowboy in, in Argentina. And this story was about uh, Alberto Gertrunov. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Uh, but he actually was born in Russia, and as a child, he came to Argentina on a steamship called the Wesser, which um, I think something like 800 uh, Jewish settlers came, and they founded a colony uh, here in Argentina. And he later became uh, an author and a journalist, and he wrote uh, stories about Jewish gauchos. And the, the term Jewish gaucho became sort of um, popular in the early 1900s uh, because of his writing. And they, people would refer to um, um, like Jew, Jews who inhabited agricultural communities as like Jewish gauchos. And I thought that was really interesting. In the same room, there was a model of the steamship Wesser, which was... Um, like I mentioned before, it carried 820, I believe, Jewish settlers. And they came and founded a, a colony in Argentina called Moises Ville Colony. And uh, in like 18, late 1800s, 1889, I think. Um, and I thought that was really interesting. There, there was more stuff in the museum as well. I didn't take pictures of everything. There really was too much in the museum to take pictures of absolutely everything. Um, but all the, the placards explaining everything are mostly in Spanish. I did notice some that had English on there as well. 
but they were mostly in Spanish. But like I said, I used uh, Google Lens on my phone, which is a great tool if you download the Google Translate app onto your phone. You can use the camera from your phone to, um, to scan like text and it'll automatically translate it and then you can take a picture of it um, and save it. So it's really good for someone like me who doesn't you know, speak some Spanish, but doesn't like fully know all Spanish. Um, it's very, it's a very good tool to like very quickly be able to read a large block of text um, or to like take a picture of a large block of text and you know, you can uh, save it on your phone or send it to yourself and, uh, and you know, go through it later and take a look. So after that, we went through the full museum. Um, I got a little turned around trying to figure out how to get into the temple itself, um, but the staff who were, were very helpful and very kind, they directed me to the temple and we were able to go inside the temple itself, which was really great. Um, the, the temple itself is, is, you know, it's quite old. It's over a hundred years old. It has amazing architecture inside. It's really, really, um, like it, it, it was very, it was very quiet when we went in there. Uh, I was the only person in there, and it was very quiet and very peaceful. And looking up at the architecture and the, like the beautiful stained glass windows and everything inside was really amazing. So um, I got a few pictures in here from different angles, looking back, you know, looking up and from the doorway, and then also looking back at the. Um, at the door from from like up at the front of the temple, and it really was just a very um, it was a very very cool way to end the entire um, experience of the museum. You go through the whole museum, and at the end, go in and actually see uh, the inside of the temple itself, the oldest um, temple in in Buenos Aires. So, I would say overall. It was a really good experience. Um, it's something that I would definitely recommend if you're into history and you are in Buenos Aires. Um, like, I, like I mentioned before, uh, they, they do have some security that you'll have to deal with. You will have to give your passport um, and some sort, or some sort of identification so that they can log um, uh, you know, where, where you're from. And uh, it was free technically to go, but they did have a suggested donation, which was, um, the suggested donation was, I think it was $10 US, yeah, $10 US or 8,000 uh, pesos. And that is 8,000 pesos at the time that I filmed it, which is like early December, 2023. So with the inflation in Argentina, if you if you come later, it could be something you know much. It could be much higher um, as far as pesos, but as far as dollars, it'll probably that'll probably remain the same, about ten dollars U.S. So that's going to be it for the video. It was overall a really good experience, and I would definitely uh, I would definitely recommend it and do it again if I were in Buenos Aires. So so I hope you enjoyed the video. Stay tuned for the next one, and we'll see you soon.